Hello and welcome to the first of our ACCA P7 Advanced Audit and Assurance Lecture Recaps. Okay, the first lecture we had was on audit regulation and the first thing that we looked at was the International Federation of Accountants or IFAC. The three main areas that we need to concern ourselves with on this module are the International Audit and Assurances Standards Board who are responsible for developing and promoting the ICES and the other assurance regulations that we look at, the Ethics Board, which is responsible for ethics, and the Transnational Auditors Committee, and this is responsible for international audits, and we look at transnational audits throughout the module. So, there are a few problems with IFAC. First of all, it's financed by the profession, which is always a bit of a conflict of interest. Also, there are differing national interests. The US, for example, being very reluctant to adopt international standards. And the power of the big four accountancy firms is also a problem. Solutions to these problems? Well, first of all, there was a forum of firms which sought to seek the input of the large accountancy firms. Again, the collapse of Anderson created a problem with this. So in 2005, the Public Interest Oversight Board was set up it really focuses on overseeing the IAASB. So global problems. Well the first global problem is a harmonization. It's difficult to harmonize and it's very complex when you're trying to cross borders and implement international standards. Another problem was Enron. What happened at Enron? Well first of all it was off balance sheet transactions. Subsidiaries were set up and not shown on the Enron balance sheet where they could then hide losses and avoid tax. They were marking to market at the time which meant that they were crystallizing profits before they'd actually made them. There was unethical leadership throughout the firm and there was a flawed culture. Why was it important? Well first of all creative accounting was being used which now has been banned. It was US based and they thought they had sufficient regulations to prevent this sort of thing. Global ramifications, it was a very large firm known throughout the world and of course the collapse of Andersons was a very important event for the accountancy profession. So there was a lot of fallout from the Enron collapse. First of all the US introduced the Sarbanes-Oxley Act which we'll look at shortly and the EU introduced the International Standards and Auditing. The UK also did a few things. Uh, it ended the self-regulation of accountancy firms the APB was now held under the Financial Regulatory Council rather than being separate. Creation of ethical standards was also a fallout from Enron. The Public Oversight Board was set up to cover accountancy and actuarial provisions and the Audit Inspection Unit oversaw audits of anything that was in the public interest. So this brings us on to corporate governance. The key points surrounding corporate governance are that we need to have effective management, we need to have oversight by NEDs, non-executive directors, there needs to be a fair appraisal of performance, there needs to be fair remuneration, fair financial reporting, a sound system of internal controls, and shareholders relations need to be focused on to ensure that they're rights are upheld. A couple of models then. Um, first of all the unitary board. Now this relates really to the UK and Ireland because they have very similar a uh, corporate law. What it means is that the collective board responsibility, i.e. the board all have responsibility rather than the CEO. Non-executive directors and the executive directors have the same responsibility and that's set down in law. The non-executive directors and the executive directors have a different function and this must be set out by the firm. And there must be established committees, you know, the remuneration committee and audit committee for example. This is opposed to a supervisory board. Now this would be the sort of board they would have in the US and similar jurisdictions to that. It has executive managers who effectively run the business and then also has boards and committees who oversee that executive function. So let's look at a little bit how on how corporate governance is enforced. First of all we'll look at the US 
Well, we mentioned it before, it was Sarbanes Oxley, introduced as a response to Enron. So section 202, first of all, this sets out that the chief executive officer, or the chief financial officer, must certify several things. Firstly, that the filed report has been reviewed, that it does not contain untruths or omit facts. They've also got to certify that the position is stated fairly, both in, in terms of the results that they're reporting and the cash flows. That they are responsible for designing controls and for ensuring effectiveness of those controls. Any deficiencies must be disclosed both to the audit committee and to the auditor. And any control or internal control changes must be disclosed. Okay, so that's section 202. Section 404 of Sarbanes Oxley then relates to the internal control report. Now the internal control report is uh, issued by management each year and sets out the responsibilities for internal controls and the effectiveness. The auditor then must report on the management's responsibilities and effectiveness and state their opinion on it. So those are the, the main points around Sarbanes Oxley in the US. In the UK we have what's called the Combined Code, which you'll have seen before. A few of the, the key points around the Combined Code. First of all, it's a unitary board, which means, again, we have collective responsibility, as we discussed previously. There's separate CEO and chairman to separate the powers. There's a The board members must all have sufficient ability to sit on the board. There must be terms set out for the board development and for the balance of the board. There must be timely information produced by the board. Directors must have their performance evaluated and their remuneration must be disclosed. And again, there must be sufficient internal controls. So those are the main points of the combined code. If you're not sure in any of them, go back to your notes and just make sure you understand them. The audit committee then is a key point in the combined code. The objectives of the audit committee will first of all to increase public confidence. If you've got an independent audit committee, public are more likely to believe your accounts. They will provide financial expertise to the board and they'll also provide independence for the external auditor because the external auditor will be able to report to the audit committee. The makeup of the board then, or the audit committee, sorry, they all must be non-executive directors and one member at least must have recent relevant financial experience. What are the functions of the Audit Committee? Well, first of all to review internal controls, also to review internal audit and the reports that internal audit do. They'll advise on the policies, the financial policies of the firm and review the accounts. They also provide a whistleblowing function for the firm and will also liaise with the external auditor. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of having an audit committee? Well the advantages are that first of all you get better quality accounting because you've got financial experts there to advise. You'll also get better communication between the directors and the external auditor. And related to that you'll avoid conflict because there'll be that communication between the directors and the auditors and it's less likely that there'll be conflict between the two. So those are the advantages of an audit committee. On the other hand Management may distrust the audit committee. There may be simply too much detail for the non-executive directors to understand. Management may feel that it may lead to a two-tier board and also it may be more costly than not having an audit committee. So that was our lecture on audit regulation.